present um, a big picture of uh, some of the recent results that we have in this project that have been uh, going on for two years now. It's about um, investigating the interactions between reflex DCG and transgenital effects um, in the thermal adaptation of uh, the Rhizophila mutabeta. Um, we know, I think something changed. We know that we know that the reasons. Well, we know that organisms can respond to environmental change in different ways. You know, they can respond in, in plastic ways too. Now we have two different kinds of ways that are plastic ways that they, they can respond to environmental change. We know that if they respond during the time of one generation, that's what we know as the classical of plasticity, but they can also have uh, plastic responses uh, during the time of consecutive generations, which is what we know as maternal effects or transgenerational effects in this case. Uh, we also know, uh, we have a lot of information about their interaction, for example, between plasticity and selection, when selection can shape plasticity, or when plasticity can modify or influence the, the, the acts of, of selection and the free result. But now that we have um, these transgenerational effects, there is not very clear information about all these interactions between yeah, transgenerational effects, selection, and plasticity, or even if what happened and what is the kind of interaction that is happening when plasticity and transgenerational effects are happening in the same trait. There is not too much information on that. Uh, for example, there is only one model that we know so far that includes both plasticity and maternal effects as a trait in itself to be able to change over time, be modified by selection, and actually evolve uh, over time. Based on this only model that we know, uh, we learned a couple of things that were important for this project. One of them is that both plasticity and transgenerational effects can uh, be or are expected to evolve in the created environments in comparison with constant environments, for example. And in addition to that, not only the fluctuation is important for transgenerational effects, but also the autocorrelation between the environment of the parent and the offspring seems to be important for the evolution of these kind of uh, effects. Based on this, uh, we wanted to basically explore all these kind of interactions, what happen when plasticity and transgenerational effects are happening in the same population. And we wanted to use uh, the flight on the desert, the Sophila of Mojavens is taking advantage of the ecological context where, where, that they have. So, uh, talking about the distribution, for example, they live uh, in very cold environments as, as the Sonoran Desert, for example. Um, this population here in red. And there is also a very established population in the Catalina Island, the blue the blue part of the distribution. As we can see, um, the, this the population has a substantial difference in terms of the kind of the level of fluctuations that they have. Being Sonora, the Sonoran Desert, the more extreme and more fluctuated environment uh, in comparison to Catalina. And we wanted to use these differences to explore this, this kind of interaction, knowing that the level of fluctuation seems to be important for the evolution of plasticity or transgenerational effects. So we wanted to do that, uh, measuring penetrative plasticity and transgenerational effects, the component of each effect on the thermal adaptation of the sopholomohavensis in two different life stages, in the larva and adults. And we wanted to do that between basically uh, three different approach. First, we used that same model that I presented in the beginning to perform individual-based simulations using the real data, the climatic data from these populations and then ask the question, is this level of fluctuation in these populations enough for plasticity and transgenerational effects to evolve? Second, we actually measure uh, uh, the inner type, the phenotypic uh, plasticity and transgenerational effect component of the each response of the flies. And finally, we explore the gene expression related to this, uh, this 
kind of effects. So this is the results of the first part, for example, the individual-based simulations. We basically, as I said, we feed the model with the real uh, thematic data from these populations. We use the real generation and kind of Drosophila mohavensis, and we were able to differentiate during this um, generation time the initial uh, part of the of the generation time as indication of what can happen in the larva, what we call here the um, the the juveniles in comparison to adults, and we compare what was uh, the level of acidity expected in this simulation. So basically, we have very interesting things here. So first, if we look at the differences between population, for example, comparing Sonora and Catalina, we see that the more frequently reported population Sonora tends to have higher levels of either plasticity or transgenerational effect. And something that was also uh, interesting was that when we compare uh, the blue dots and the pink dots, which is the, large, the juvenile in this case and the adults, we saw also very interesting differences, being the adults uh, more plastic than the juveniles, and in terms of the transgenerational <coughs> effect, being the uh, juveniles more uh, having a stronger transgenerational effects in comparison to the adults. And this is kind of like the general picture that we wanted to see, okay, how much of these predictions are actually happening in real data. And for that, we performed these experiments uh, in two generations, we don't move here. Uh, basically, we just expose the flies to the two different temperatures, a high temperature and a control, for in two generations for the parents, and then in the next generation for the offspring for 24 hours. And then, as a result of this combination of treatments, we measure two different things. First, the, per the performance uh, post heat shock, basically measuring sort of how many larva viability survive after a, a strong picture like this. And we also uh, uh, collected samples to perform um, RNA seq responses in larva and also. So this is the results of the here of the real data. We were happy to see uh, that many of the trends that we saw in the simulation data actually are happening in the real data too. So if we look at the effect of the acclimation, for example, so the temperature that was uh, performed in the in the offspring uh, in the same generation that the, the each of was measured. So the red boxes versus the blue boxes, we see that there is a strong uh, a phenotypic plasticity effect uh, being higher uh, in the in the acclimation in comparison to the control in all the comparisons in larva and in adults. If we look at the at the parental effect. 36 versus 25 in each population, we, are, we see something interesting is that in the adults, we didn't find any transgenerational effect. It wasn't significant. But we found very strong transgenerational effects in the larva, consistent with the, with the simulation data that was expected. And in the case of the larva, because we have plasticity and transgenerational effects at the same time, we have some sort of interactions that are very interesting. So when we compare, for example, uh, we made the comparison between populations. We can see that uh, both plasticity, even in the adults, where plasticity was significant, and transgenerational effects in the case of larva are both higher in the more fluctuating population in Sonora in comparison to Catalina, which was uh, very consistent with the, with the simulation data that I showed uh, in the previous slide. Then uh, we wanted to see, okay, we detected these effects it was consistent with the simulation. So what is the genetic basis of them? Um, there is a working hypothesis that yeah, these transgenerational effects are just an expression of other kind or the same genetic basis as, as, as is expressed in plasticity. I wanted to see if they actually have a different uh, genetic basis. So we basically did this RNA-seq in larva and adults. And as you can see, uh, the data is consistent also with the phenotype. So as we can see from the blue dot, this is uh, differential expression in plasticity, plot against differential expression for transgenerational effects, and the blue dots are showing the significant genes related to, to phenotypic plasticity. So we see that many genes are related to plasticity in larva and adults, 
but we found only transgenerational uh, related genes in the lab, and not even one gene significant at all. It's just consistent with the phenotype data that I showed in the, in the previous session. More interesting is that in the case of larva, where we have plasticity and transgenerational effects, there is a, not only a high overlap between plasticity and transgenerational effects, but there is also a very a strong negative correlation between those two, and this is one of the things that we want to explore more in detail uh, for future, future directions of the project. Then, looking at the kind of genes that are expressed in these effects, we can see we compare, for example, plasticity for adults and plasticity for larva. We can see that given the high uh, overlap between those two, it's expected that many of the genes are related to the heat shock response. So basically, everything that is enhanced by the heat shock transcriptional factor is basically uh, happening in these in this two kinds of plasticity. But something interesting is that in the case of the adult, we have two additional categories. One uh, related to serial modification and actual formation, uh, indicating that the fly is not only responding to the heat, but the fly is also becoming more aware of the, of the environment, of sensing the environment uh, better than, than where the heat shock is not, is not present. And we like to think that this uh, actual formation is already indicated in some kind of uh, maternal effects already uh, in the adults. When we look at the kind of genes in the transgenerational effects in the case of larva, we also see this kind of uh, category related to collagen modification. When we look at the kind of genes and what is happening in, in, the, in the biochemistry of this, this interaction here, what we find is that these genes is modifying, these genes are modifying uh, the collagen in a way that the collagen becomes more resistant to the heat, more stable to higher temperatures, which is something that makes sense for this kind of phenotype. And given to this general result, we were tempted to uh, perform like a working model, basically for future directions of the project, something that we want to test. So what we think that is happening is, is that when we use a long-term heat shock as the one that we use, basically what's happening is that of course, they increase the heat shock response. They become more aware of the, of the, of the environment in the case of the adults. Uh, we like to think that this actual that the increase in expression is some kind of indication that it, there are more <coughs> effects happening in, in the adults. And somehow, whatever is being transferred between the adult to the embryos, for example, end up with an increasing of this modification of collagen in this transgenerational effect that we show. But something that is difficult to explain is that when we look at these genes in the adults, the, the, the collagen-related genes, these genes are actually down-regulated in the adults, and that's sort of what is difficult to explain. But we know that when we compare this collagen, like in other systems, for example, in melanogaster and C. elegans, this collagen is related to the heat shock response too, but it's related to the initial part of the heat shock, which is the part that we don't have. But it's something that we want to do. And we, will have, we like to think that this initial increase of collagen is basically being transferred during, during the embryo formation and end up in this equation of this increasing of modification of collagen uh, in the next generation. And yeah, that's it for now. Thank you everyone for coming and thanks to our collaborators and the funding.